Okay. Um, likes. Okay, so we're going to start with a 10 to 15 minute presentation and that will be um, presented by our main panelists here today, Elijah Taylor and Nicholas Scruton Alvarado. Um, so you guys have the floor and take it away. All right. Um, so I'll just start the presentation. Um, yeah, so thanks Kat for the uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so my name is Nicholas, as, as uh, you may have already heard, and today I'll be giving you a quick presentation on the science of COVID-19 without the jargon, hopefully, um, followed by a questions and answers panel, which will be moderated by uh, Elijah and I. So uh, a quick introduction of who are we? Um, so we are a, a student uh, team called A New COVID Communications, um, which was organized by, by Catherine, but um, is actually populated by, by all of us. So today, uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'll, I'll be talking to you this presentation. I'm joined by Elijah and Catherine, and Xavier will be moderating uh, your questions. So as, uh, as was previously mentioned, we are all graduate students within the PhD program uh, in Inter Interdisciplinary Biological Sciences at Northwestern University. Um, so we'll do our best to answer any and all questions you may have uh, regarding the pandemic or, or, or general science. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. So what is COVID anyway? Uh, I'm sure we've heard <laughs> this the past year, hundreds of thousands of times. Um, so COVID is the illness. It's a coronavirus induced illness, but it's not actually what causes it, right? That is the actual virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2. Um, it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Um, and it was the reason there's a 19 next to COVID is because it originated in the year 2019. So SARS-CoV-2 is a type of virus called a coronavirus, which I'm sure you've heard in the news many, many times by now. Um, so this is a coronavirus. It's a type of virus called an RNA virus. Fun fact about them is that they're actually named after solar coronas, which is the light um, that kind of surrounds a solar eclipse, which it reminded scientists of the shape of the virus as seen under a microscope. So while obviously the most famous coronavirus in the world right now is SARS-CoV-2, we've actually been dealing with coronaviruses for years now. And one of the most common ones actually includes the common cold. So what is an RNA virus? Essentially, the easiest way to think about a virus is essentially just a small package of protein that encapsulates the genetic instructions of how to make more viruses. In this case, for an RNA virus, um, that instruction is, is a molecule called RNA. So what is RNA in the concept of biology? Viruses, um, so there are DNA viruses and there aren't mRNA viruses. Um, it, and the way that they infect your cells is by hijacking something central in biology called the central dogma, which is how we get from our genetic instructions to our proteins um, that make up who we are. So there's two simple processes, which we won't really go into detail, which one turns DNA into R mRNA called transcription, and one which turns RNA into protein called translation how COVID-19 infects, um, sorry, how SARS-CoV-2 infects the cell is by hijacking this translation mechanism and using host cell um, molecules to replicate its own genome, its own proteins, and make more of itself. As we're all aware, aware once infected by SARS-CoV-2, you begin to present a number of symptoms, which I'm sure you've all heard this a million times, but we'll cover them briefly again today. So the most common symptoms include a cough, a fever, as well as chills and muscle pain, which are all general of, uh, of coronavirus illnesses, such as the common cold and the flu, um, but can also extend to shortness of breath, sore throats, uh, as well as the loss of taste and smell. How we've been fighting this coronavirus since uh, uh, about a year ago 
is by the approach of the three W's, is watching your distance or social distancing, making sure your hands are washed frequently, either with soap and water or hand sanitizer, and wearing a mask when you're around others so you don't, uh, you don't spray droplets. But we've been doing this for a year now. The most exciting new development in the past few months have been vaccines, right? So what about these vaccines? At the moment, there are three COVID vaccines that are authorized uh, in the US. The Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, as well as the recently confirmed Johnson Johnson vaccine. The key thing that you need to realize about these vaccines, which I'm sure you've all heard by now because I'm hoping that most of you have been vaccinated, is that they all have a really, really high success rate uh, in prevention, hospitalization, and severe coronavirus. In fact, all three vaccines have 100% success rate in their clinical trials for the prevention of hospitalization. Some differences between these two vaccines is that the RNA vaccines, which are Moderna and Pfizer, require two doses to reach full immunity, whereas the Johnson Johnson vaccine is a more traditional viral vector vaccine and only needs one dose um, after reach immunity. So how do these vaccines work? This lovely schematic was made um, by members of our team um, and I'll walk you through it. Essentially, what a vaccine is, is a small fragment of, uh, of the virus. In this case, it's this specific pike spike protein, which makes up part of that enveloping capsule that makes up the virus. This spike protein is fragmented um, and the instructions that make up it, either RNA or DNA, are encapsulated within the vaccines. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccine use RNA instructions, whereas the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses DNA instructions for this viral fragment. When you're injected with the vaccines, um, these instructions on how to make these little bits of the virus are introduced into our cells, which are then translated, much like would be during viral infection. However, these fragments do not have any infectiousness uh, capability or um, disease risk. So what our body does with these fragments is it activates our immune system. And our immune system learns how to recognize these cells and how to fight against the coronavirus infection when you're actually infected by the, um, by the whole virus. This uh, creates um, this immune response, uh, which happens after your second exposure, in which um, once your immune system has been primed, it responds not only faster, but stronger to a second infection. That is how you're protected from the coronavirus infection after um, you're vaccinated. So I want to take a small second now to talk about something called vaccine efficacy, which I'm sure you've heard about in the news many, many times by now. So essentially vaccine efficacy is just how well do these vaccines protect you against coronavirus. Um, and there's been a lot of numbers thrown around, um, but I'll walk you through them step by step. So what you have to realize is that when we're talking about vaccine efficacy and comparing the three vaccines against each other, it's we're not exactly comparing the same thing because the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines actually tested something different than the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. For Pfizer and Moderna, their um, vaccine efficacy number was actually derived from um, how many people did not present any symptoms of COVID during their clinical trials which in this case, the Pfizer vaccine was 95%, the Moderna vaccine is 94%, and the Johnson vaccine was 72%. However, when you start looking at other um, um, types of COVID, such as severe COVID or, or COVID that requires hospitalization, these numbers begin to change. In the terms of, in the case of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, both vaccines 100% prevented severe COVID. The Johnson & Johnson, in the meantime, um, its efficacy rose to 86%, a 14% increase between symptomatic COVID. By the time you get to the most severe form of COVID, which is hospitalization or, um, or, or yeah, hospitalization COVID, all three vaccines actually reach 100% protection. Essentially, what this tells you is that if you're worried about um, potential consequences of COVID other than just a symptomatic um, kind of cold or flu, any one of the three vaccines is pretty well equipped 
um, to prevent that from happening. So I've talked to you a little bit about the biology of the virus, uh, as well as how vaccines work and what they do. But how does life return to normal? The first thing that I'm sure many of you want to know is what can you do once you're vaccinated? So this guidelines were taken from the CDC for about, uh, about two weeks ago. Um, and it walks you through what you can do now that you've uh, been vaccinated and reach immunity. That's important to understand. Um, but what also stays the same, what you should keep on doing, um, much like you have been doing for uh, the previous pandemic. So the things that you can do, as I'm sure you've heard, um, is that you can be indoors with other fully vaccinated people without a mask, indoors with one vaccinated household, so one set of grandkids without a mask, um, and you don't have to quarantine if you're exposed to COVID. Obviously, these regulations um, may be changed locally, so listen to, <laughs> to, to, to what people around you are saying. Um, but these, these are the CDC guide, uh, guidelines that have been established. Taking this in mind, there are many things that we all have to keep on doing um, in order to bring an end to this pandemic, such as wearing masks and still social distancing in public, avoiding large gatherings, avoiding traveling when possible, and still watching out for COVID-19 symptoms in case um, you present an infection. The second thing that will lead to a return to normality is this concept of concept called herd immunity. Herd immunity is, is essentially when enough people are vaccinated, vaccines not only protect the vaccinated individual, but people who can't get vaccinated. In a vulnerable community, that is to say a community that doesn't have access to these vaccines, an infected person can infect other susceptible people. This is how the infection grows. If this person infects four people, these people can infect another four people, and it's an exponential rise in cases. In a protected community, that is to say a community that has been vaccinated or for majority vaccinated, um, that one infected individual will have a hard time infecting individuals around it because most of us will be immune. Once the population vaccination rate reaches a certain threshold, um, in, in this case, the, the traditional threshold for herd immunity is around 80%. Um, that's when most people consider the pen, um, a disease to be under control. So, with that in mind, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, um, but we'll move on to our questions and panel section where I'll be happy to clear up any questions that you may have had um, over this presentation or any others that, uh, that weren't directly addressed here. So thank you very much for watching um, and, and I'll take it over to Gan now. Thank you, Nick, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and as always, if you have a question, please type it in the chat or uh, raise your hand. We're going to begin with some pre-submitted questions. Um, thank you everyone who submitted these questions. Um, they were really helpful in guiding this um, presentation um, and making it directed towards what you were interested in. So our first pre-submitted question, um, why, especially after the second dose, do people uh, experience mild to severe symptoms? Um, I heard that it is the immune system working, but thought a strong immune system would prevent you from getting symptoms. So um, I'll, I'll answer this one. So the reason that after vaccination, um, you, you sometimes, not always, sometimes present symptoms is because the symptoms that you're experiencing, such as uh, a fever or a cough, are actually things your body does to try to clear the infection. Um, so the reason you get a fever is to essentially raise your body temperature to a level that's not suitable for viruses. The reason you cough is because you're trying to clear your airways from your lungs from vir viral infection. So what vaccines do is they make your, they make your body think that they've, it's been infected without actually infecting the body. So your body learns how to deal with infections. Um, if you present symptoms, it's a totally normal response. It just means your immune system is, uh, is working as it should. Great. Um, our next question is, how are these new variants different from the original COVID-19 strain? 
is this going to be a big problem or is this normal in the pandemic? Uh, and, and I think uh, normal being um, normal in the course of a viral spread. Yeah, so um, Nick, if you could go back to the presentation real quick and have that on um, one backup slide of the hub to explain us a lot better. Yeah. Sure so thing. to answer the, so the answer is the, to the first part is, um, if we can go to this, all right, here we go. So if you can see, so what happens is the, pro, the um, protein, as Nick mentioned on the outside of it, it's called what's known as the spike protein. This is what allows the virus to get into your cells in the first place. What happens with new strains is that the outside changes, which here is represented by different colors, it changes in a way that allows it to maybe be better or worse at getting into those cells. Um, this is a natural part of viruses spreading around because unlike our cell phones and whatnot, um, these viruses don't have a spell check for their code exactly. So it makes it so that they do change over time. Sometimes they become more variants of concern, which is where you have the you know UK variant or the South African variant. These are variants that you know concern the public health community because they believe that one, they may be more infectious and two, they might evade immunity from either prior um, COVID infection or by vaccine immunity. So what ends up happening is they end up like watching these variants to make sure that they don't do either of those things. And you know, so some evidence shows that these variants are in a way more infectious than previous vari variants, but in different studies, um, they've shown that the vaccines that we currently have um, authorized in the United States are still effective against these variants. Yeah, I want to also add that variants arise because of mistakes or um, in duplication. So when vaccines and even in our own bodies, like uh, when proteins or mRNA is made, um, it's not always 100% accurate. And so um, with increased infectiousness, we actually have increase of the probability of getting these variants. So that's, this is also another reason why you should get vaccinated and everyone should get vaccinated so that the decrease in, in infection in the community is lower and therefore the uh, probability of these new and more harmful variants arising is also lower. Um, I will also have to add that variants, COVID variants have been circulating since the beginning of the pandemic. I think when I checked in possibly March of 2020, um, there were six major variants in the US um, that were circulating, but we never heard about those in the news, mainly because they didn't cause any um, harmful effects um, that were of concern. Um, so this is kind of natural. All right. Um, we have another question that was pre-submitted by Elizabeth um, uh, asking, I have been vaccinated, but my family overall has not been. What can I do safely with them? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll answer this one. So according to what we currently understand about what vaccinated people can do and can't do, um, if your family is within one household, that is to say that they spend um, they, they share a home, for example, parents and, and their kids, um, you as a vaccinated person should be okay um, um, visiting them and, and, and spending, spending time with them unmasked. Um, there is a small caveat to that, which is if there's someone within that unvaccinated household um, that is at risk of severe COVID, either because of other diseases or if they're particularly elderly, um, it's it's recommended that you you still wear masks when uh, when you visit them. This is not so much because um, you might get uh, severe COVID, but because we're not sure if vaccinated people can still transmit the virus to to low levels. So really, you just you want to protect everyone else. Thank you for that. Um, we have some questions in the chat now. Uh, why do people get more sick after the second dose instead of the first dose? I can answer this one. So the first dose, uh, if you haven't been infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2 before, is effectively your body's first introduction to uh, the spike protein, or rather the RNA that encodes the spike protein of the virus. So that is the first time your body is seeing it. So the first dose is effectively introducing your body to that protein and letting it uh, acclimate and recognize what it looks like, letting your immune system 
start to recognize exactly what that protein is shaped like and develop antibodies against it. The second dose would then be the second time that your body has been introduced to that thing. And now, because it knows what the spike protein looks like and has antibodies against it, it can actually begin an immune response. So uh, like Nick mentioned earlier, uh, symptoms like a fever, like a cough are uh, emblematic of the ways that your body actually fights an infection. So the reason why with the second dose, you tend to get sicker, quote unquote, um, and have more symptoms like a fever, like a cough, like fatigue, is because your body has been given a chance before to recognize these uh, uh, viral components and is now fighting them. So in the first dose, they haven't recognized it yet, so they're not yet fighting uh, what appears to be an active infection. In the second dose, which is just more spike protein, they're now able to fight what appears to be infection, make even more antibodies uh, and go further, which is why those symptoms come up. Yeah, so in the graphic that we sent you in panel six, um, there's a little graph, two humps, um, and that's kind of showing how the immune responds. And so, you know, the first time uh, you get exposed to this virus, and in this case, it will be via vaccine, or you can do this naturally, uh, and this happens with all different viruses. Um, your immune system is trying to figure out, you know, is this me or is this a virus? And so the, the peak is kind of low because there's a lag time of when your body is trying to figure out how to fight it. And, um, and so the response is somewhat dim. But that second time, once your body is trained, this is not me, this is harmful, we have to get rid of it. That second peak is much, much higher because your immune system knows how to fight against it and immediately uh, puts like all out war. So that's why you see more symptoms in that second dose because your body is like, all right, time to have a fever, time to get rid of this. And then they are trying to get rid of it very quickly. Okay. Great questions, everyone. <laughs> the chat is popping off. So we'll move on to the next one. Can you comment on the extreme spectrum of symptoms in various individuals? Um, for example, healthy people sometimes die and elderly uh, unhealthy individuals sometimes survive. Uh, what can be an explanation of this? I can also uh, comment on this one. So there are many, many, many factors that will predict the uh, course of disease uh, given a particular infection. As we learned earlier, there are lots of different variants of COVID, uh, hundreds of different variants that have been sequenced uh, across the world. So that's one factor is, do you have a more virulent strain of COVID? Another factor is viral dose. If you just uh, inhale one virus particle, one viral particle, you're a lot less likely to become as sick as somebody that inhales a whole mouthful or hundreds of viral particles from a prolonged exposure. Um, another factor is uh, somebody's genetics. So some people may have uh, slight variations in the proteins that SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> in their lung cells that makes them a little more susceptible. Other people may have um, fact like they live in an area with a lot of pollution uh, and therefore have a lot of irritation in their lungs already, making them slightly more susceptible to respiratory diseases like SARS-CoV-2. Um, and there are lots and lots of other factors that uh, it would be hard to get to. But in short, there are uh, many different pieces of the puzzle that can determine how somebody's viral infection goes. One of my jobs as a researcher is trying to predict outcomes uh, once somebody comes in the hospital. And even if we collect uh, robust clinical data um, related to viral load, related to a person's genetics, to their white blood cell count, to their immune response, et cetera, we're still not very good at predicting whether or not that person is going to live, whether or not that person is going to have severe uh, symptoms for a long time, or whether or not that person is going to recover just fine. So in short, nobody really knows. Um, it's a very hard puzzle to solve, and some of the best minds in the world are working on it. 
uh, and it's hard because there are a lot of factors to take into account. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, do COVID tests distinguish between the different variants? No, so I can give a pr pretty simple to answer. That one is um, COVID tests only test for the presence of, of the virus uh, within the body, either um, the, the DNA, the, the RNA of the virus or, or proteins that make up the, the virus. Um, but detecting if it's present isn't enough to figure out what kind of variant it is. For that, we need to do a different test, uh, which, is, which is called a sequence, uh, in which we identify the, the actual sequence of the genome of the virus, which tells us what variant it is or what evolutionary um, tree it came from. Okay. Um, could you comment on the efficacy of treating COVID-19 with nitrous oxide nasal spray apparently used successfully in Europe? I will answer this question because I had to just look this up. Um, it's not yet approved for the United States and I don't think they're even trying it yet. Um, but the question refers to a sanitized nitric oxide nasal spray um, whose intent is to exterminate the virus in the, uh, the airways and stop it from intubating into your cells and spreading to the lungs. Um, this treatment is based on using a nanomolecule called nitric oxide um, and essentially uh, it has it is a natural quote unquote uh, treatment because nitric oxide is produced in the human body in different places. Um, and it has proven, uh, nitric oxide has proven antimicrobial uh, properties. Um, so I, I cannot say that I don't think the CDC is looking at this treatment just yet, um, but you know, with some clinical trials in Europe, it's probably going to eventually come over here and, you know, be uh, looked into as a candidate for prevention or treatment of COVID. But for now, um, what is approved in the U.S. and what is uh, seemed uh, and shown to be effective is the vaccines as well as um, wearing masks. Okay. Um, so our next question is, um, I think this is from the Belmont Center. We had the Moderna vaccine. Uh, will we need another shot, um, a booster shot of vaccine because of the new and upcoming strains? So I'll answer this one. Um, the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, it depends on how many variants arise and how different these variants are from the strains that our vaccines protect us from. So there are ongoing tests to figure out um, um, if we'll need booster shots um, to our current vaccines to protect us from the variants. Um, but essentially, we don't know at the moment because we don't know what we're going to be dealing with in six months, one year down the future. Um, the good news is that um, the, the vaccine development process now, this new vaccine technology is quite easy um, to adjust. So if uh, a, a strain becomes prevalent enough and different enough that we'll need a booster shot, um, we can hope that the, the vaccine development time is, uh, is, is as short as, as these original vaccines took. There is another question that came up right before that, and that is, is it better to receive one shot with Moderna and one shot of the Pfizer because they attack different parts of the spike protein? Um, my lab jokingly calls this the Arnold Palmer. Uh, <laughs> the short question, the short answer is uh, no, because we don't know that such a treatment would actually be more effective. The only way to do that would be to run a clinical trial like they did with both the matching uh, Moderna and its booster shot and the Pfizer and its booster shot. They don't actually uh, attack different parts of the spike protein. Uh, both are based on the same concept that Nick explained earlier, where you inject some mRNA into the bloodstream and that encodes for uh, the same spike protein. They just use slightly different um, delivery platforms. So they're not actually all that different, but in order to know for sure if uh, it would be more effective to combine them, a clinical trial would need to be run. And I don't think that uh, any would be underway. 
All right, thank you guys. Um, moving on to our next question. Oh yeah, is it better to receive a shot of Moderna and a shot of Pfizer because they attack different parts of the spike protein? Reese kind of just answered this question and right now we don't know if that's effective um, because there has been no clinical trial. I believe I did see one either in the UK or the US where they are, um, no, okay. Um, I thought I did. <laughs> I'm wrong. Um, but thank you for that question. So we're going to move on to the next one. Um, when is the vaccine actually effective? Is it right after you receive the second dose? Um, and specifically, what is the time period for Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer this one because I, I um, glossed over it during the, during the presentation. So like a good rule of thumb is um, back immunity tends to develop about two weeks after your, the completion of your treatment. Uh, in the case of Moderna and Pfizer, that's your second shot. Um, second, um, please remain muted. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so the rule of thumb is about two weeks after the, the, the completion of your treatment, which is the second shot in the terms of Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, in terms of Johnson & Johnson, um, again, this rule of thumb two week period tends to apply, although um, the press statements released by Johnson & Johnson um, claim it's about, I think it was 28 days from your first shot that you're fully, uh, fully covered by, by, by the vaccination. Great, thank you. Um, do you know, how much do we know about um, vaccinated people being able to transmit the virus? So the reason we don't know too much um, about how well vaccinated people, um, how, how much of the virus vaccinated people um, can transmit is, is because we, the, the tests haven't come back for that yet. So the, the reason why we think it's, it's not completely sure that vaccinated people can't transmit the virus is because we don't know um, how well the virus survives in vaccinated people's noses, right? Um, we don't know the level of antibodies that are localized in that area. So when you inhale the virus, it might still be able to replicate uh, within your nose. Um, it won't cause any, any systemic infection in you because the rest of your body has enough antibody levels um, to, to defend against infection. But if the virus is still replicating to a minor amount in your nose, Every time you sneeze or you cough, you may be spreading it out more. Um, there are ongoing tests to figure out the level of, of this transmission, um, but we don't. We really we just don't know yet. I also want to highlight um, Nick is um, Nicholas has been saying. You know, you can transmit the virus by sneezing and coughing, but you can also transmit the virus by talking to someone. Um, it is just a higher probability because of the force and the um, increase in respiratory droplets that you emit through sneezing and coughing versus talking, um, which is why staying six feet away from someone else, even though um, they're not sneezing or coughing is really important. Absolutely. Um, yes. Just so wanna make that a little more clear. Um, and then Brianna texted when uh, from the Belmont Village facility, when we got the second Moderna, all our residents did great with no symptoms. However, younger individuals have many, many more severe symptoms oftentimes. Why could this be? So um, I, can, I can take a stab at this one. Um, Kind of similar to uh, Reeves's answer, depending on um, explaining why different people react differently to COVID, sometimes in unpredictable ways. Um, it's a similar train of thought um, to that. Essentially, as I mentioned previously, when you're vaccinated, your body thinks it's been infected without actually. Being yes. So he's automatically going to be mayor. But excuse me, please remain muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, like. Uh, real COVID infections, different people's bodies will react differently to um to to an infection. It's fantastic that uh that that all the residents did great and didn't have any symptoms, um, and young individuals may have had symptoms or may have symptoms, 
Um, but this just has to do with how your own uh, in, immune system reacts to, to vaccinations. It could also be the case, um, there is something called a cytokine storm in, um, I think younger patients were having cytokine storms which caused bodily, bodily kind of um, failure that was happening in the initial phases. And it could possibly be because um, our bodies are doing more rigorous like attacks. And you know, you have fevers and you um, are emitting other particles that are, you know, killing cells, but um, fevers also affect your own body. Um, our bodies kind of regulate it at a temperature at which we can function. And so in getting a fever is kind of very ineffective. Yes, it kills off viruses, but also it disrupts our normal bodily processes, which is why when you have yes, something, yes, I, you know, I, that I, one. Uh, something like a virus and when you're sick, yeah, it's it so bad because your own um, bodily processes are being interrupted. Um, yeah. If, if anyone has any questions, please put it's them in, in, in right the chat. It's a woman right now, I believe. Yeah. You must be involved with our um, Okay, thank you everyone for these great questions. Um, is there a better outcome for patients with different blood types uh, and or if they take supplements such as B12 vitamins or vitamin D, et cetera? I've seen a few different studies on this. Most of them have been inconclusive. Uh, and the ones that have been conclusive uh, about blood type in particular haven't exactly um, agreed on which blood types are more susceptible or not. Uh, I would hesitate to make uh, definite conclusions about uh, the role of supplements the role of uh, basal B12 or vitamin D levels, the role of different blood types. Um, so yeah, in short, uh, it's unknown right now. Yeah, there was some evidence like um, earlier in the pandemic that people with vitamin D deficiency might be more susceptible to severe COVID or hospitalization. But when it came to actually giving those patients vitamin D, very mixed and inconclusive results on whether or not that actually helped the patient in real time. <laughs> yeah, as, as an overall thing, I think the best thing you can do is eat healthy, live a healthy lifestyle, you know, um, and, you know, give yourself the best protection and best shot at defeating viruses in general, not only SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, you know, until we have more studies, um, you know, scientifically regulated clinical studies, um, it is best to just maintain a healthy lifestyle in general. Um, cool. Next question is, when do we expect a vaccine to be available for infants under five years of age? So just about a week ago, Moderna started a clinical trial uh, for children under 12 years of age. Um, and I believe about 6,000 are uh, enrolled in that trial. Uh, so they've got, they should get some pretty good statistics pretty quickly. But I wouldn't expect uh, five or six year olds uh, to be uh, greenlit for vaccination um, anytime in the next six months to a year. Uh, in terms of vaccinating children, uh, when you're just starting the clinical trial, that means that it's going to be quite a while before um, it's, uh, that clinical trial concludes, let alone receives FDA approval. So, um, it's basically like, think back to when clinical trials began uh, for Pfizer and Moderna to when they got approved in December. And that might be the time frame that we're looking at there. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, next question is, what does it mean if you do not have any side effects from the second shot? Does it mean that it isn't working as well in your body? Not necessarily, no. Um, for reasons that I described earlier, for why different people have different clinical responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, it 
very much applies in the same way to why different people will have different immune responses to uh, vaccination. So it could be something to do with uh, the particular shape of one of the proteins in your body, uh, a particular way that your immune system works, your prior health history, uh, et cetera. There are lots of factors to take into account. So if you did or did not uh, have symptoms in your first or second shots, uh, there's no hard and fast rule for what that really means for uh, what your uh, health history looks like up to that point. Awesome. Uh, is it recommended that you would be vaccinated uh, and still get tested to ensure that you do not have COVID um, before visiting a loved one um, if it is not past two weeks of the second dose? So I think it's um, to kind of to, to answer to look at this scenario. It's important to understand what a vaccine does and what it what it doesn't. So what we know for sure the vaccines do is it protects the individual who has been vaccinated. What we're not 100% sure they do yet is it protects people around the individual who's been vaccinated. Um, so this two week post the second dose is is um, the build up of immunity, which is what protects you from COVID. Um, I would, if, if, you, if you want to visit a loved one who may be at risk of, of severe COVID if they were infected, even after that two week immunity period, I would still recommend, um, you don't have to get tested, but if, if there's a severe risk of COVID, um, it's, it might be advisable to, to get tested because there's still a chance you could transmit it. Um, that two week immunity period doesn't necessarily relate to when you can uh, you you can infect others. It just relates to when you are protected from COVID. I want to also add that these vaccines have been proven to prevent severe and hospital uh, severe cases of COVID and hospitalizations due to COVID. Um, but you can, due to the variation in symptoms, of, you know, people who are not vaccinated can still be asymptomatic and have COVID. So there's a lot of variation. So again, there's no hard and fast rule, but um, you know, getting tested for COVID is always recommended to make sure that you are not infected currently. Um, granted that when you do get the vaccine for COVID and are fully immunized, uh, you are protected, um, but the virus can still um, replicate even at lower um, Kind of a reduced rate because you are infected, uh, because you are protected, but it does not mean that you do not have the virus itself in your body. Um, okay, I think Brianna is about to type in another question, but uh, if anyone else wants to raise their hand or type in another question, we are open to answering it. We're also nearing the end of this event. Um, so fit in any last questions you have. I think it's been a great discussion. Okay, we've been a great discussion so far. Um, yeah, are there any last questions? All right, thank you so much for coming guys. It was a great uh, to talk to you all and I hope we um, helped explain some of the science as well as um, ease your minds about what's going on in the world. Thank you guys for coming.